All righty, let's open the meeting at 7.02. The first thing I need is a review and approved minutes for March 17th. Now, can I vote? I was not at that meeting. You can. can. I, okay. You All right, can. do I have a motion? Any, any comments first? Looks good. Okay, can I have a motion? Yeah, so moved. Second. second All righty, and roll call, uh, Philip. Yes. Michael? Yes. And myself. So there we go. Um, on to financial statements. Shelly, it's your show. Hello. Uh, 16 warrants were signed electronically since last meeting. Uh, sorry, my dogs are playing there. <laughs> At least they're having fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, those warrants totaled $82,586.73. It's a little bit higher than we typically see, but that was um, multiple months because in March we did not have warrants on the agenda because it was the public hearing for the budget. Um, so we're looking at two meetings ago that I'm reporting on. Um, I sent out the financial reports. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get all of our dogs going. <laughs> one, big, one big dog party in a minute. Oh my gosh. Um, I sent out the financial reports. There's nothing major to uh, report on. I'm happy to explain any overages if you do have questions on them because there are some overages. They're all <laughs> knowns and explainable. Um, the budget is on track at this point. Kristen and I have been in conversation about um, spending down some accounts that still have funds remaining. We have about 155000 remaining to be spent before June 30th. I expect that we are going to have some funds left um, due to some things that haven't been fully expended. Um, we'll go through the typical procedure that we do of transferring um, from school choice so that we can hold on to those reserves for the future. But Kristen is working on spending down anything that is remaining open currently. She has learned to spend money. Yes. You've taught me well, Elaine. Thank you. Responsibly, but what's needed. Absolutely. Got to take care of our kids in our facility for sure. And teachers. And thank you for that. Yes. And this is the year budget wise where Frank Franklin Tech is going to make us all look good. So. <laughs> Yeah, and it's nice to be able to spend right now because the last two years we've actually said, you know, be reserved, hold off, freeze budget. So it's nice that we can say, okay, Kristen, this hasn't been spent yet. What are your plans moving forward? So we're in a good spot. Excellent. All right. Any more about that? That's not where your questions are, Phil? No. I wish because I already know the answers to those questions. Though. All righty. Because I have to, I have to talk about them. Okay. <coughs> um, principal's report. Kristen sent us a principal's report, which I read. Hopefully, other people did. Um. So, does anyone have any questions? Or looks like you're in the countdown. We're in the countdown, Elaine. You're you're right. Uh, this is looking good. Uh, 12 right now. Um, kindergarten numbers are looking great. Preschool numbers, we have waiting list uh, looking great. Summer program, we're moving ahead. Thank you for funding that years ago. This has been a huge success. Summer projects, we're continuing with three floors and air conditioning, which is great. Finishing up the MCAS this week. Um, I just wanted to mention real quickly that, um, you know, since I've been at Conway, we've seen a couple of town administrators. Um, uh, we have such a great relation, working relationship right now with the town. Uh, Veronique and I are planning a picnic actually this summer for the school and town together. I'm, I'm just, I'm just thrilled. I'm really overjoyed to be working so closely with the town. We've been working on child care for the pre-town meeting and child care for the town meeting. That's I just huge. Want to sort of like say that as school committee, the working with the town is just, it's just been a wonderful addition this year. So Phil, if you can pass that on, that'd be awesome. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I, I agree. And the you you the, the school stepping up for the child care for those meetings that is is massive. It makes the school look so good. And um it's so it's so appreciated. I yeah, well hopefully um hopefully it goes smoothly and 
I've know. been in some real fun email groups. Um, there's a really fun group planning all of that and the, watching yeah. the banter and stuff is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. All righty. Uh, anything else? Okay. On to public comment. And I do believe we have public comment. <clears throat> um, are you talking, Elaine, about myself, Lisa Gaylor? I don't think so. Yes, I thought it was somebody else's name there. That that um, that's the second person, Elaine. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about the fair share amendment. And I believe that Donna sent you, sent all the school committee members some things. So the MTA and our local union 38 educators association endorsed the passage of the fair share amendment. Massachusetts voters will have a once in a generation opportunity in 2022 to make that public educate, to make sure that public education gets the permanent funding it deserves. By advocating for passage of the fair share amendment, educators and school committees are going to play a vital role in securing that future. The amendment would change the state's constitution to help address the chronic underfunding of our public schools, colleges, and universities. The amendment would add four percentage points to the tax on income above $1 million, generating up to $2 billion annually for public education and transportation. This could accomplish goals such as lowering class sizes, strengthening higher education programming, reducing student debt, addressing the impacts of systemic racism on communities of color, and restoring staff to the institutions that serve the common good, which have been hit hard by decades of austerity budgets. So what can you do? As a school committee, you can endorse the amendment by making a, re excuse me, by making a resolution. And you can see the sample resolution that I shared with you. If you want any further information, I'm happy to provide that for you. I know that um, there's a website now towards the Fair Share Amendment, and I can put that link in the chat. Um, but I would hope that I could see this on your next agenda. Thank you for your time. So can I, can I just respond, Lisa? Um, yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the, for the four towns, the, the warrants are now closed. But um, and I've seen the other three towns as uh, preliminary um, warrants. It, the fair share amendment did not make it onto any other town warrant for town meeting, except for Conway. I made sure it made. I did it, hear that. So it thank made, you. I made we sure did know made, that. I made sure it made it onto Conway's. Thank uh, you. Town meeting warrant, and it's for the town meeting to approve of it and instruct their representative um, and the select board to appro approve it. Blah 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 blah. But um, you know, I, I think it's yeah. hugely important and, um, tell, tell everybody to come to Conway town meeting and vote for it. Absolutely. So. That's, that's another reason why I was hoping school. Yeah. I think the more bodies that, um, the more town bodies that, uh, that approve it, it gets more people interested in it and hopefully it will get passed and it'll become, it'll get onto the constitution and. And help out, help out all these, help out everybody with education and transportation. But um, so actually, I just came from the Sunderland School Committee meeting, and they they did approve it as a resolution. So, right. So thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. All right. Thank you, Lisa. So, do we need to put that on our agenda next month? Or Phil, you said it's just the town has to vote it. Does well, the school committee can too, but um, it's not going to hurt. But the town. The town, the town, it's all the way at the end of the warrant. So we'll see who's still left in the room. But, um, okay. uh, you know, I, I, I anticipate it would get passed, but who knows? Okay. Who knows? I, I think it's directly related to school funding as well. The, the way, you know, the, the minimum alternative contribution that the towns make is, is, is everybody's zip income from the zip code divided by the number of residents compared to the other three towns. And we get penalized for the millionaires in our midst. Mm -hmm. We have to subsidize the millionaires in our midst right now with our school taxes. When, mm -hmm. when, when a millionaire moves into 
a, a small rural town in Massachusetts, everybody else's taxes effectively go up. So interesting. And that never gets talked about. So except, we can, so we'll put on our agenda to vote next month so we can have it there, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Lisa. And there's the next two is the other town co uh, public comment. <coughs> I thought Donna said something today that so and so couldn't speak, but somebody was speaking for them. <clears throat> yes, Asia. I believe she's talking for. Uh, be here for oh, okay. There we go. Hey, if you don't there mind, you. you can move her up in the agenda so she can get out of here. Darius, it says Melissa Novak on the. <coughs> Okay. I'll delete that. Okay. All right. So we're going to let Asia go now. Yes. Okay. Hello. So my name is Asia Sarone and I co chair the district CPAC. Um, I want to start by giving a huge thank you to all the admin, general ed teachers, special ed teachers, related service providers, and IAs that dedicate themselves to special education students in our district. Um, I'll also say that I'll keep this nice and short because Conway is doing fantastic. So in the state of Massachusetts, each school district has to have a CPAC and one of the main duties is to evaluate special education programming and provide feedback to school committees. The other role that we serve within this community is supporting and educating families. So we hold a variety of meetings, um, business meetings with admin and school committee members, networking nights for family, staff and community, a variety of informational workshops, and then our twice monthly family support groups. A lot of the work we do is behind the scenes. Um, we answer special education questions, help families get connected with each other, give referral info on services and specialists within the community, and share local events. Um, in order to evaluate the district, we reviewed policies, procedures, gathered state data, talked to administrators throughout the year, used family reports, and the district's survey data. Conway has 28 IEP students, which is 19% of the school population. Of those IEP students, eight are school choice into Conway and seven are out of district placements coming into the school. And there is no homeschooled IEP students. There's three special education teachers for a nine to one student to special ed teacher ratio, which is on par with the district. And Conway has no out of district placements in other schools, which obviously saves you guys a lot of money. The BSEA is a state agency that helps with the IEP development process. Um, their numbers kind of help us gauge if families are having issues agreeing on an IEP. Um, the only caveat is that they only provide district-wide statistics, so it's unclear how many were at Conway specifically. Um, but overall, there were 14 rejected IEPs, seven requests for facilitated IEP meetings, four requests for mediation, and no hearings. Um, I would kind of doubt that many were in Conway because families seem to really like it, as you'll see in a moment. Um, PRS is a state agency that investigates claims that a school is not following IEP laws. Conway had no PRS complaints in the past year. We did a joint survey with the district that went out on Parent Square. Conway had a 25% response rate and they were all positive. Um, everyone rated their experience very highly. They loved staff administrators, service availability, team approach, atmosphere, and communication, and there was nothing that they wanted to see improved. Um, the following are district-wide recommendations. Nearly all of these were made based on issues at other schools, but I think that every school in our district would benefit from these, and it'd be good to have everyone on the same page. So we're recommending professional development on the new restraint prevention and behavioral support procedure and special ed procedure manual. Um, we'd like to see professional development on IEP process, goal writing, documentation, and timeline requirements. We'd also like to see a PD on the stress that families of students with disabilities experience and how to best collaborate with these families during times of stress. Um, and also how to repair strained relationships so that families who provide lower ratings or are feeling upset about the way things are going um, can feel more comfortable with our district and we can just show that we can meet them wherever they're at, even if it's a hard time. The CPAC is recommend, recommending that anti-racism and equity work continue to expand to include students with disabilities. 
Um, and we'd like to see a training on how to interact with IEP families in a culturally responsive manner, which includes race and ethnicity, but also includes specific subcultures like the deaf community or the neurodiversity community. Um, we recommend increased oversight um, through random auditing of IEPs to ensure that everything is being provided, timelines and laws are being followed, progress reports are accurate. Um, and this self-monitoring would just allow administrators to pick up on issues before any complaints were made. And again, we don't have any specific recommendations for Conway at this time. Things are going really great, um, but I'll take any questions if you guys have any. I really like that report. Thank you. Yeah, it's very positive. Thank you. Yeah, you guys Thanks, are Lisa. doing great. Any questions from the committee? Great. Thank you so much for the feedback. We appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. Um, all right. Unfinished business. We'll go jump back there. MASC policy update. Is that you, Darius? Yep, this is the, uh, actually you're going to be voting on the um, Section D financial um, policies. And there's many of them, and I kind of went through them slightly last time. I, if anybody has any questions on them, they are, um, again, recommended by MASC. A lot of language change in, um, just for clarity and such is the majority of them. But Make I sure Shelly doesn't run off with all the funds. There is a line that Shelly cannot run off with all the funds. I think that's Good. one of them. Okay. <laughs> all right. So are we ready to vote? Any discussion? Nope. All right. Can I have a motion to Pat? Do we have to just do Section D fiscal management goals for MASC? Is that good? You could group them all, the proposed um, Section D. Um, updates and there's a full list of them there. That's good with me. I second, I second your motion. Okay. Roll call. Uh, Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I'm a yes. So we are good. All right. COVID update. Actually, that's fun. <laughs> Yeah, you guys had an exciting two weeks here. Um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put Kristen on the spot and have her kind of comment because she did. She's just done a wonderful job managing this this spike that we've had in the awesome. school. Thanks, Sirius. Um, so, you know, we haven't seen real high numbers in Conway, but um, from uh, May seventh to today, we've had 35 cases of COVID. Um, yeah, which is, you know, we've really been very low. Um, we can attribute that to several things. Um, um, none, nothing that looks like a school spread except for one um, one classroom, which I'll talk about. So, um, the, you know, it seemed to have gotten into um, some groups of students that do some extracurricular activities outside of school. And so, you know, if you have, for example, just for an example, seven students who ha are involved in an extracurricular activity together, the student one gets, you know, COVID and two days later, student two, the student three. So we seem to see that. And then in addition, the siblings start getting COVID, the parents start getting COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so we saw two big pools of that kind of situation. Um, not, this was clearly related to exactly those situations. And then we saw um, a little, you know, we called it a spread and we hopped into action very quickly. Um, you know, cert, you know, cons consulting with Darius for every little step of the way here in the preschool. Um, so we had two students and then, you know, I was, at, I was talking to Darius on Sunday and you know, we decided Nurse Sarah and, and I sent out an email after talking to Darius, um, strongly encouraging um, the preschool students to number one test before they come back, came back to school on Monday and to wear masks, strongly recommended. Within 15 minutes of that email, two parents contacted me with two asymptomatic preschoolers saying they tested positive. Um, the rest of the class came back. 
everyone was masked. Um, we did our regular pool testing on Monday. Um, we we sort of got preschool right under control right away. Um, and, um, you know, parents were in contact with us about, you know, symptoms and things like that. All of the children seemingly having cold-like symptoms. Um, and then um, any of the other COVID cases, we trace them really carefully. We're not really doing contact tracing, but for example, a student who might have COVID, had you know anyone who has COVID? In, a, in, in all cases, it's a parent or a grandparent or someone they're directly related to out of school. So except for the preschool, any other classroom that we had two or more, we couldn't find a school trace. However, we sent the email um, after Darius's email in collaboration with Darius's email, noting what the, who those classes were and asking, uh, strongly, strongly recommending that um, students and staff wear masks in those classes for two or more cases. And we'll continue to, do, you know, use that practice. Gotten really positive feedback from parents about, you know, thank you for updating us. Thank you for, you know, the recommendations. And um, some students who have had COVID over the past, you know, 30 days or so um, might not mask. But most of the students are masking during this time. I told the parents that we'd be back in touch after this pool testing, which I will. This pool testing, um, came up with one positive case, that was it. So that was today. So I'll be emailing parents about that. And we're hoping that we um, we stop this spread. The, but the, the most effective was, um, you know, working with Darius and Nurse Sarah and really just hopping on it really quickly and, and taking those steps pretty quickly, notifying parents, masking up, doing their tests. But we asked all the parents, all of, the, all of the students who signed up, which is the high majority, get we have a pool test on monday and on thursday we send home a rapid test and i know that some families having talked to them test every thursday and some wait you know there's no symptoms if there's nothing going on but we did ask parents last week to use that test on thursday so therefore the children would be tested on monday they'd be tested on thursday and we also put a note out to you know test on sunday before they came back as well parents, parents have been i mean been just phenomenal, really great with responding to all of those requests. So that's great. What we, had, we had some pretty big staff shortages last week, but um, oh, I can you know, Conway, they were doing whatever they needed to do. To, yeah, to, that's yeah. Amazing. thanks for the update, Kristen. Um, and that's spiking everywhere. I mean, I've got, had our front desk has been. <laughs> No one left standing. It's crazy. That's five clinics. <laughs> yeah. Um, our, our, board, right. our board of health. Our board of health says that most of the people testing positive in Conway aren't aware of any symptoms when they test positive, and that and that we're supposed to be focused not on tests and you know positive test numbers. We're supposed to be focused on hospitalizations, and our hospital is still empty. So. Yeah, so Phil, we did. We have we have gotten uh, many who didn't have any symptoms, and those that do have been cold-like symptoms. We've had some that have had some fevers. We really keep a close eye on all of the students and staff who have COVID and try to check their systems. You know, in, in the email, we you know I offered support if people need food, if they need whatever they need, just to reach out and let us know. But um, symptoms have been cold-like, some fevers, um, and and some no symptoms at all. That's what we've had too. Um, Denise is here with us. She just couldn't log in. So she's going to talk to Dawn about that. But she's the, I assume, the 413 ending in 18 number. Um, all righty, on to new business. We did CPAC school choice recommendations. Do we vote those tonight or? Yeah, okay. I assume, Kristen, that's you. Sorry, Kristen, I assumed it was you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so what we've been doing the past couple of years is that we've been uh, recommending um, one or more per grade, um, which sort of which sort of um, lets us look at the number of students in each class and then make in the needs, the needs, right? So you might have a class of 19 and a class of 13, but you don't want to add any school choice to the 13 class because of the needs of the class, the 19 class, maybe what? So um, if you, if you do give, if you do approve um, more than one, um, that gives us some flexibility with that. 
Good. All right. I'll move for to approve the more than one policy. I'll second it. All righty. Uh, can I have a roll call? Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. Myself? Yes. Denise? Yes. All righty. It's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being so thoughtful about it, as always. Um, MASC policy update, foundations and basic commitments, first read. So we have it to review. You have to review, and just for clarification, I sent out another version of sexual harassment. I mean, you guys are going to give me for harassment on the amount of reversions of sexual harassment I've given you. Um, but our, um, tried, I tried, Phil. It didn't come out well. Um, <laughs> basically, after it by the attorney, uh, well, the attorney kind of sent out an updated policy, um, and they basically are recommending that the um, sexual harassment policy be divided for employees and students to have separate policies based on the fact that students are protected under Title IX is a different type of investigation when there's harassment yeah. towards students. So he said that even though the, the other policy has it written in there, it's a lot cleaner if you have two separate policies, one for adults, one for employees, and one for students. And so that I'm passing on that recommendation to you. Um, and so I gave you an updated one to look at. So this is the first read. If you have heavy questions, let me know in advance because this is written by the attorneys, not by me. Um, okay. And so I can get those information for you. And do you want to update us on the next admission procedures and administering mm -hmm. meds too? So we also um, are looking to update we have our nurses. Some of our nursing policies have to be updated every every two years. Um, and these are included in, so, you know, basically the um, policies have new language around um, Administration of medicines, Narcan's included in that in the update. Um, additional information about storage, self-administration, um, clarifications around those regulations, and then added sections on documentation, documentation, delegation, and special circumstances. And then the other one is the JFAR is basically the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Immunizations requirements to get into schools. They're updating it so they're exactly the same and also making sure that we have protections in for those families who, um, you know, maybe under protection of the McKinney-Vento Act, basically homeless families or families who don't have access to make sure that we're doing our best to um, get those students in school and supporting those families who um, need to get those immunization shots and not just, not just close the door and say, come back when you're ready, but help them out. And we've been doing that for years now in our district. Those are the policy. Alrighty. So if everybody would review those next time, that would be great. Um, appointment of regionalization subcommittee rep. This is what I'm here for. Oh, I bet. Phil is going <laughs> to volunteer to be on that committee. No, Phil is going to trash the committee first and wants, uh -oh. to, wants to really talk about what where we're going and how much we're really just sleepwalking already through this. And... Um, so, um, so, you know, and, and first of all, you know, just in, in light of what's, what's the, was it Cummington, the, 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 in their regional district, uh, they were the, they're the highest per capita and the, be the best performing elementary school and the rest of the district voted to close them down. And, um, and, and, you know, and, and, why, and what, what's that? Who was that you're talking about? Was that's the town of Cummington? I think they lost their elementary school because the rest of the district voted to close it because of the declining district-wide population, and they were the best-performing district with the highest uh, student population in the school per class and the highest per capita income um, of the district. And the rest of the district, um, and, and they lost their out their elementary school because their regional agreement did not protect them well enough. And so we are already in, the, so already it, this, it was frontier. So, so, so for, for those that you don't, we have an operating agreement with the four towns to create the frontier regional school. We do not have a written operating agreement for, to create the superintendency union known as union 38 that we are in. And, and so that's the genesis of this, is the desire to get 
a, 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 an operating agreement that formalizes the relationship between the four towns. Uh, and, 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 you know, but it already started at, for, with Frontier School Committee saying we're going to do this. And, and so, so we're already starting from the point where our vote as a weighted vote is 16, 17%. So, and, but, but the, but the frontier operating agreement that we are a part of gives all four towns minority rights. Okay. It says that any change to the frontier operating agreement has to be voted on by all voted favorably by all four town meetings, which is huge. Okay. So they can't, they can't close part of frontier school without all four towns agreeing. But right now, if we just go through with this process as it is with us being in this frontier, whatever committee is where Deerfield gets their 48% and Sunderland gets their 26%, um, we are already at risk 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now when the declining countywide enrollment is going to require us to close a school we are already at risk to because of the way this is already baked in. And, and you can't say, well, you can discuss it when the committee is formed, because at that point, you're asking someone like a Deerfield to take less than half of the vote that they would otherwise be getting or are already getting. So this has to be like exit the, the protections for minority towns to keep us from having our school closed against our will has to be part of the process before the process starts. We are not going to be able to convince Deerfield or Sunderland to give up votes because otherwise they know that, um, you know, it's going to cost them more to close us down because the only way that, that if, if all four towns have a town meeting veto, the only way that you get your elementary school closed is if it also makes financial sense to your town, which means that they would have to pay in some regard. So, um, so, so what, what I'm like already not okay with is a committee that has started as its starting basis, the frontier weighted average, because it does, this committee does not involve this, the expenditure of federal or state funds, the one man, one vote, uh, strict, strict does not apply to the creation of this committee. So if all four towns have the veto power at town meeting to anything that is ever produced by this committee when it's functioning, then I can rest easy and know that we will not have our school closed in the future, 30, 40 years from now, against the town's wishes. And I don't see any other way out of that dilemma. So can't you be the rep on the committee and suggest that that's one of the things? So the I, I, I need to kind of jump in and clarify because Phil, I think I believe you're wrong. Okay. Because what I'm asking to create is a superintendency union agreement, which currently does not, it's not a regionalization. We are not giving up the rights of towns as part of a, the superintendency agreement like this is a superintendency agreement for Unit 31, okay, where basically explains the function of the superintendency agreement and how it functions. And you are correct that by opening that box, how the voting of the, the job of the superintendency union, which is to hire, evaluate, and hire the superintendent and the business manager, um, it's to, it's, it's, those are the jobs of union 38. Okay. That, and then we do collective bargaining together. Okay. It is not a regionalization agreement. It's a, you guys are collectively, you guys are collectively joining together to use central offices, um, myself and central offices as your, as your, uh, your administration, but you have no means of, Right now, if Conway hates me and they want to get rid of me, you have no legal course of how to do it. And it, it will be a, and, 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 or 
right now, if I, you know, if I decide I'm going to retire this year, um, and you guys want to go hire a new superintendent, and you have two people that are, you know, there's a division amongst the towns of who to select, you have no process as to how do you select the next superintendent. You have no, right now, you go behind a closed room and hope everybody can agree. But let's say you have major disagreement, you have no legal recourse, you have no document to run off of. Um, and that's what these super, these super, and I can send you a copy of one that basically, um, you know, that, you know, think places like Hampshire Regional just worked on theirs. They have the same kind of idea. They have five, they have four towns saying to a regional high school and the towns are all separate. It's five separate school committees. So that's what I'm looking to do. Nowhere in it is going to talk about taking the power away from the school committee at all in the governance of their school. It talks about where is the school committee's power because right now, I, I'm saying we should talk about it when there's not conflict, because if conflict was to come up and there's a division amongst the five, the five towns, being the fifth town being Frontier, about what they are doing with the people they're overseeing, there's no process on how do you rectify that. There really isn't. I don't, you know, if, you, if there was grounds for dismissal, for me, that was not, I'm using me because it's easy for me to talk about myself and I'm not offended by myself. Um, but you know, if you had, if, if, unless I did something illegal, you couldn't break my contract and, and move me out. You wouldn't, you legally, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a ground stand on because you don't have a proper process to do so. And so that's what I want to have a discussion about. There's nothing to do with, I don't want the rumors out there that we're looking to create the ability to close schools. That's a regionalization agreement. That's, that's taking the power away from the school committee. So, however, the fill where you are correct is what is the weighted vote? What is the vote? to put a superintendent, to vote for the superintendent, right? I don't know what that looks like. Because right now you have Frontier, you know what I mean, that has that has a vote. Then you have people that are represented on Frontier who are also on this committee. Are they, is that two votes? And what about, you know, someone who is on at the at-large bid and is also on this committee? Is that is that an additional vote? Like those kind of things. Right now, if it was a split vote and it came down to the hairs, you guys would all be in court trying to figure out what to how to how to settle this. And I, I don't, you know, when um, one of the attorneys was dealing with a similar district like ours that didn't have this, they didn't know where to go with it. And so, you know, right. so I think you, you know we so need to correct. I, that. Yeah, so I, I do see the error of my ways when it comes to my reasoning. There, I do see that. Um, but the the uh, did, we, did we record that? Did we? Get yeah, 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 oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, um, okay, but uh, I am. Um, just on the alert for the, the, the count the countless ways Deerfield and Sunderland can put it to us if they want to. That's all. And, I mean, there's also like, and I don't. And this let's go to the other job that the the superintendency union does. So it negotiates the contract with the teachers association and the IAs. Um, what if it went through the whole process and Conway is the only is the only school that voted it up? The kind we'll, we'll keep it positive. Only voted for the negotiated contract, and the other ones voted it down. What's the process there after the negotiations are complete? You know what I mean? Does it go back as a full group, or is it each individual town at that point? It'd be good to have language about that um, clarified in the in the agreement as well. But how does that work? Well, I mean, you know, the, but the flip side of that is that right now, if Conley wanted to, it can negotiate its own contract with the teachers. <laughs> And I'm telling you, we would do a better job, like faster and better for, and fair and for everybody. And, and it should become the new policy of, of Union 38 to just have Frontier lead off and uh, to have Conway lead off, negotiate its own contract and let everybody else follow our example. That would that would solve all of our problems. Um you're sounding, we're sounding a little conceited right now, Phil. No, I'm serious. <laughs> but if I am another district, should I allow you to do that? That's unfair. And, and when you have joined, when you've agreed to be part of a of a group of other towns to do the business of it, to threaten to pull out at any single time, it's, you know, it's... I know. How many more cycles in a row can we just go through the other towns just bollocksing this up, though? I, I mean, yeah. So you guys, this is a, an impossible district. You know what I mean? So this is this is meeting number five with the same agenda that I'm doing by the fifth time. You know what I mean? Um, I know. So I know. like I, I get it. There's a lot of things that are broken. I'm just trying to I'm seeing spots that 
I mean, realistically, I shouldn't be the one pushing this forward because right now I'm protected by the fact that you guys don't have a system to remove me. You're right. You're right. I, I, but, I've, I've <laughs> tried to push this forward a little bit, but it didn't get too much too much headway. So the idea is, so what I'm looking for is a volunteer to join the group. It'll start in September. We'll start by looking at what a superintendency agreement has in other districts and what do we want to do, um, and then map out how much work that is. Is it a couple meetings or is it a lot more? Then that will come back, the recommendation, something that we'll write up <laughs> by the attorneys. We'll come back to this, each school committee to be voted on to then send to town meetings as, as a thing. So that's kind of the process. It could take all of next year and be put on it, or it could take it could take almost two years, depending on you know the is the, is it complex or is it straightforward? You know what I mean? Is it a is it a five page document or is it a twenty five page document? I don't know. Depends the I guess it depends on the attorney, right? Right. The hour rate. All right. Who's interested <laughs> in this besides Phil? Anybody else? Do we want to put Phil up for it? Be my big mouth. I, I nominate <laughs> Andrew for the. Uh, I will second position. that nomination, Michael. <laughs> Could we have a roll call vote, uh, Michael? Yes. Denise. Yes. I will vote yes. Bill, you gonna vote for yourself? No, I, I'll abstain. <laughs> okay. Bill, and, I, and I'm happy Bill's on it because I do want someone who's got a loud voice to protect the smaller. We have two yeah. smaller communities and two. Why, thanks. So we can count. That somebody's not. While we disagree on sometimes on things, it's good to have that loud voice in the room. That's very true. I'll try to be quieter. No, oh, that <laughs> forget that ship sailed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On to curriculum management solutions, CMS, CMS, small I equity audit. So, um, you know, I'm looking at bringing in a to do an equity audit of our schools. Um, an equity audit. If you didn't have time to read the whole document, I suggest you go somewhere near the back where it does the summary proposed. It says the summary of the proposed um, services. But basically, um, you know, in consultation with Sarah Mitchell, who works has worked with this company um, as an auditor, um, and. Um, this is a nationwide company that comes into your district and takes a look at all your programs, your, you know, where your students are at, your students' different backgrounds, and from where our funding's going to, you know, who's accessing what, and basically does an equity audit. And, and, and you can see in the other deliverables of what they're looking at, um, and then they will give us back a report. And this is kind of an extension. It is not the an anti-racism equity audit. It is an equity audit that includes racism, you know, looks at racism and other marginalized groups, um, but it is looking at all of our students and it will do an extension of our, um, you know, it is an extension of our anti-racism and equity work, um, but it's also looking at the full programming of all of our schools. Um, and so I'm moving forward and doing this. And what I want is to get the school committee's approval as well so that I can bring this, to, so that you have the buy-in. So when I come back with the report, you've kind of commissioned the report as well so that I'm accountable to the outcome of this report. Um, right now, this would probably take place in March of next year based on the, their scheduling already. And we would get the report six weeks afterwards. Um, it's a heavy price tag for an audit. Um, basically, it's $35,000 divided over the Five schools, so that kind of you know, it's not not a whole lot when you really break it down that way. But we're looking to paying for it using a grant and also using some of the SR three money that we had used that we had put aside for professional development because this is going to help drive professional development as well. So um, it's also going to bring you know to light you know some of the work of our, our anti racism equity group to really look at some of the numbers and they really look at data. You know, they're going to come in. We have to provide them a ton of stuff in the fall, whether they're going to review it, and then they're going to come out in person and do that as well. So um, these are professionals, unlike for those who have been part of like NEASC, um, where they get volunteers to come through and they get led by professionals, that kind of thing. These are not volunteers. They are people who get paid for their service, um, and they have a very good reputation. So um, I think that sounds like a pretty good price, actually, for all that. So do you want to vote from us tonight on this? Yeah, I want to vote of support. Um, so basically you're supporting the equity audit, and that means that just kind of it binds you that I when I bring this back to you, you you're gonna you remember, yeah. 
All righty. Can I have a motion to support the equity audit? I'll make a motion to support the equity audit. Second. Phil, second. All right. Roll call. Michael? Yes. Phil? Yes. Denise? Yes. And I vote yes. So there you go. And foundation statement, anti-racism and equity. So I'm treating this like a tied to the equity audit. It, well, in a way, um, this is actually coming out of, so, you know, last month we did get a, uh, a uh, overview of the anti-racism and equity group and Romney Associates talked about the, you know, where, you know, we've, what we've done this year. Um, this has come out of the policy committee of that group, um, we, you know, which I'm on. And when we were looking at policy, we didn't have any kind of uh, umbrella statement about what is anti-racism and equity mean? And because there are different definitions of it and have people have different approaches for it. And sometimes you hear that even within our community. So we created this foundation statement and uh, just hard work from that committee to create it. And then it was approved by the full committee. And now I'm sending it off to school committee for you guys to read it. So this is the reading of it. And then at the next meeting, um, we can discuss it and you can vote to add it as part of um, um, part of our policy book and also put on our website and such that this is what we believe. Um, it, just to break it down, overview, it gives the purpose of it, the definitions of equity, um, anti-racism and, and educational equity, and then the beliefs around that. And then what I think is what probably the most important page is that the last page just talks about our intentions, which is basically the action steps of this work. And where does the school committee fall within that? So, um, you know, please take a read through it. Um, if you have questions, I'll, you know, um, certainly try to answer them. If you, as you're reading them, you have even have your questions, let me know in advance and I can even reach out to the committee and stuff to get the feedback on that. So, um, Great first step, it's good. A continued step. I thought, it was really, I thought it was really good. Yeah. I thought it was really good. Those things are not easy to, to come no. up. No, and you could tell the, the care that went into it. It was not a copy and paste job. Yeah. So, it was draft upon draft, because it, yeah. it was written in committee. So yeah. <laughs> you could tell. You could, and then you there was some people feel it. And it wasn't, you know, I'm on that committee, but there was a subcommittee of writers that put that put in a ton of work into that. And so my thanks to them. That's awesome. All righty, superintendent's evaluation. Just a reminder that you need to get that done this week. And this then week? what's the deadline? So uh, Friday. Friday. And then the chairs are going to get together and or I don't know how you guys are going to do it, but I'm being told you're going to get together. Someone's going to write a summary of that with the information. You're probably going to have the summary written. Then you'll get together to agree on it. And then we'll discuss it. This time we're going to try it differently. We're going to do it separately at the June meeting instead of doing a joint meeting where people can't. People felt like they were. Um, that they Silence. Were too many people at the table. Kind of do. So whatever. Try this way. Have fun Great. with it. If you haven't done it, make sure you do, please. It's important. Um, I think we've already done. Uh, Denise, is there a collaborative report at all? There isn't because the meeting's next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. I know that that's what the last meeting said. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I think we're good with our reports. No need for executive session. Anything else? Do we want to think about meeting in person in June? Yeah. Be kind of nice to be together for the end of the year. As long as numbers come back down, they're, they're kind of saying they should come back down the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we'll all be together Saturday, June 4th at 1 p.m. for the Conway Annual Town Meeting. Yes, of course we will. But Outside. It's not outside. It's inside. It should be. Yes. Good luck trying to rent a tent now. Yeah. All right. So let's lean towards in person next month um, to close out the year, but we'll see. We'll keep an eye on things. All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Phil. Yes. Michael. Yes. Denise. I'll take that as yes. And uh, I vote yes. Thanks to everybody for all your hard work.